Often, one of the last things on a newly diagnosed AYA cancer patient's mind is, let's start a family. In the chaotic, frightening time after a diagnosis, big life decisions are usually put on the back burner so you can focus on survival. And for the most part, it's okay to prioritize your health over other things, even things that seemed important before cancer. But when it comes to fertility, waiting to talk about your options can be tragic. In this episode of Come On In, AYA Cancer Unfiltered, we demystify oncofertility, what it means and why it's important in Diagnosis, your fertility options before treatment. Oncofertility may sound long and complicated, but really the definition is very simple. It's a combination of the word oncology, meaning the diagnosis, treatment, and study of cancer, and fertility, which refers to our ability to reproduce. So basically, oncofertility is the relationship between cancer and our fertility. Dr. Lakshmi Kondapali, a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility expert at the Colorado Center for Reproductive Medicine, explains why fertility preservation is particularly important to AYA patients because of the possibility that cancer treatment might impair their future ability to have children. My role as an oncofertility specialist is to think, one, about the fertility issues, but also to expand that to consider sort of the whole host of reproductive long-term side effects as a result of their cancer treatment. It's true. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy work by killing rapidly dividing cells in the body, targeting both cancerous cells and healthy ones. That includes sperm and eggs, which can be permanently damaged in the treatment process. Particularly for female cancer patients, we know that natural fertility declines for women, even outside of a cancer diagnosis, just naturally over time. And so to, on top of that, put on treatments that may actually accelerate that decline in fertility, by the time a patient is, has completed their cancer treatment, um, their fertility might be substantially reduced or they may even enter into infertility and, and may not be able to have biological children in the future. And therefore, being able to offer fertility preservation options before they go through their cancer treatment really optimizes the options that a patient has after their treatment. Now, you may be wondering what these fertility options are. Like, how do I preserve my fertility? For post-pubertal males, so men that have gone through puberty, the mainstay of fertility preservation method is sperm cryopreservation or sperm banking. For post-pubertal girls, we can freeze eggs, we can freeze embryos, and an experimental procedure that we can offer is ovarian tissue freezing. Depending on the type of cancer a patient has, their fertility preservation options and the way that I approach them from an oncofertility standpoint can be quite different. For example, patients who have a large abdominal or pelvic tumor may require pelvic radiation. That's a patient where I would discuss with them a procedure which is called ovarian transposition where we can actually surgically suspend the ovaries and try to remove them outside of the radiation field. For a patient who has a hematologic cancer, such as leukemia or lymphoma, the options that I uh, discuss with them might be a little bit different. For example, ovarian tissue freezing is an option that is available for leukemia or lymphoma patients, even in a pediatric population. However, the successful pregnancies that have occurred from using frozen tissue have resulted from transplantation. Unfortunately, patients who have blood-borne uh, malignancies really aren't candidates for transplantation. The last thing that we would want is for an AYA patient to overcome their cancer and then have the potential of reintroducing those malignant cells through the transplanted tissue back into that patient who's now a survivor. Other technologies that may be available to you are testicular tissue freezing and embryo freezing. In testicular tissue freezing, samples are taken from the testicles and frozen with the hopes that they can later be used to produce new healthy sperm. 
Embryo freezing is freezing a fertilized egg for future implantation after cancer treatment is over. This is done if there are concerns that frozen eggs may have difficulty being fertilized later down the line. My approach to AYA patients when I counsel them about maximizing their future fertility potential is one, by discussing with them and reviewing with them fertility preservation options that are available to them even before they undergo their cancer treatment. In addition, I also discuss with them that there's lots of different ways of making a family and sometimes it is using your own eggs and sperm and sometimes there are opportunities to use donor oocytes or toner sperm or even adoption as being an alternative option for parenthood. While it's great to hear the clinical perspective, it's also important to hear real stories of patients who've experienced it firsthand. Very generously, David Craig and Lauren Lestowskis from Grit Health have offered to give us some insight into their experiences with oncofertility as AYA patients. Hello. Uh, this is Dave Craig. Uh, I was diagnosed with two different primary cancers in my 20s. Um, both were testicular cancer, just two different tumor types. Um, and then I was also uh, a co-caregiver to my father going through bladder cancer when I was 30. My name is Lauren Listowskis, and I was diagnosed with cervical cancer two weeks after my 23rd birthday. And additionally, I was most recently the caregiver for my mom when I was 30 during her ovarian cancer diagnosis. But first off, could you tell us a little bit about Grit Health? Where does it sit in the AYA cancer world? Yeah, um, when I was going through my two cancer diagnoses in my 20s, I was working as a patient insights researcher. And the irony is that even though I did that work professionally, I was so overwhelmed by my own diagnosis and the lack of support that I was getting that I was just totally paralyzed. And so Grit Health is our effort to try to bring those two worlds into harmony, to be able to provide information and support patients because we know what it's like to be on that journey ourselves. And Lauren, how are you drawn to Grit Health? What's your focus there? So I am the vice president of community at Grit Health, and I kind of stumbled along Grit by posting in a closed Facebook group, kind of started working with the Grit Health team, and it grew, and I've been with them for a few years now. And my main focus is definitely on the community members. So we welcome everyone to Grit Health, and my main focus really is on cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers, really helping to help them find and use their voice, whether that's really just being able to roll over in the morning and tell their spouse how they're feeling, or even becoming a professional advocate, and also in the patient experience space of showing people and bringing awareness and education to that, so people know that their experience really truly does matter and what they went through and are going through can really help make changes in healthcare. Both of you were AYA cancer patients who dealt with problems with oncofertility. Can you share a little bit about your connection to fertility preservation and sexual health during cancer? Yeah, and this is something I've really had a lot of help to be able to talk openly about because when I went through both of my diagnoses, there was no even acknowledgement of these issues. And so, you know, after my second diagnosis, um, I had to start on hormone therapy and I started with an endocrinologist, you know, whose primary patients were men in their seventies going through prostate cancer. And, you know, at the time I was, I had lost my fertility. Um, I was suffering from the effects of really low testosterone you know, like um, sexual dysfunction and all of the, you know, issues, including mental health issues that go with it. And I kept saying to my doctor, like, I just can't live like this. Something's terribly wrong. And my endocrinologist's response was, well, I'm giving you the exact same care that I'm giving all of my patients. And what he didn't acknowledge was that I wasn't like all of his patients. I was a young adult going through a very different experience. And so I had to fire him and find a new medical team that treated me like a young adult. And then through that, I learned about stupid cancer and 
watched other people talking about their issues and they were dealing with it. And that opened up this whole world to be able to talk about it. And so, you know, to see people now finding others that are talking openly about these issues and to not have all kinds of shame associated with them, that changed my life. And I know for me, being diagnosed with cervical cancer, I was ironically actually working in the medical field at the time with an OBGYN practice. So I knew exactly what was going to happen with every surgery and every organ that was removed and what the future was going to look like for me not being able to get pregnant or carry a child. And so I luckily had that background information and it was really unfortunate because when it came to my final surgery where I lost my fertility, no one said anything to me about if I wanted something done before that. So meaning, did I want to harvest my eggs? Did I want to freeze eggs? Did I want to freeze embryos? Did I even have any family planning goals, anything like that? And it's almost like because I was 23 and I didn't openly express any of that, nothing was shared with me. There was maybe 90 seconds with my oncologist where he said, I had to bring it up. And he said, well, if you want to go get a fertility consultation, you can. And that was literally the end of the conversation. So nothing was ever done. Um, and like Dave mentioned, I'm on hormone replacement therapy as well. And still just no mention of that now, even seven years later. And then regarding sexual health, I, you know, unfortunately the nurse, I get the two questions. Do you have any pain with intercourse? Do you have any bleeding with intercourse? And then we just move right along. Like my sexual health doesn't actually truly matter when there's a lot more to be asked and talked about than just pain and bleeding. And luckily uh, being an advocate myself and having the confidence and the knowledge to speak up for myself, I do ask more questions. I do tell them more than they probably want to know. And it's just really sad to think about people that don't feel confident and empowered enough to even ask those questions beyond what's being asked of them. So what do you do at Grit Health? What do you provide for AYA cancer patients? Right. So our programming at Grit Health for the community can really vary. We do really casual kind of meetup style conversations where those are just open discussion, anything goes, whatever topic someone brings up, and really just providing people a safe place to do that, whether it's in those casual meetup style conversations or a really interactive session on a specific topic with a subject matter expert. I always make sure our speakers are really personable. Uh, our programming is never like a lecture. <laughs> you know, we're never going to have some physician or a researcher talking down to you. It's really conversations with these people that are experts in the field. We get to talk about it with these people and really give them a sense of empowerment, feeling empowered to even talk about your experience. Hopefully you can do that in your next doctor's visit and really truly tell them openly what you're really dealing with and going through rather than potentially suffering in silence. Jania Riekel, an oncology social worker and a three-time cancer patient, has also experienced difficulties with oncofertility. Hi, Jenny. You had ovarian cancer. How did that affect you? Were you made aware of your fertility status? The ovarian cancer came out of left field. I don't even know what field it came out of. It came from some other universe. I was like, are you kidding me right now? It just, I was in such a shock. I think the ovarian cancer, to be honest, and I've said this before, was much harder than the osteogenic sarcoma cancer because I had choices as an osteosarcoma to let go of my leg. I didn't have the choice to um, keep my eggs, harvest my eggs, take care of my fertility. They just, within 12 hours after I got diagnosed, totally hysterectomy. 
So I didn't get time. I didn't get the choice to say, can we hold on? Can we harvest my eggs if I want to be a mom? I never had that opportunity. Were you given fertility preservation options? And if not, do you wish you were? Yeah, I was not given the option to um, to harvest. I was not. They were just like, we need to get this out. It was an early stage. Now, mind you, I was staged as 2B, 2B or C. Uh, otherwise, normally ovarian cancer is diagnosed at stage four, right? It's the silent killer for women. So I was diagnosed at stage 2C. And the only reason, it, or 2B, is because when they poked the ovary, the blood fell into the cavity of the abdomen. And when that happens, then you have to stage it at a higher stage. But it was still two. It wasn't even stage three or four. It was very early. And their thing was, okay, we need to go in and do a total hysterectomy. So I was never offered um, fertility options. Even if I could never be a mother or could never maybe have children, um, still the option to say, okay, I have eggs. Maybe I could have tried, right? Um, I wish someone had said at that time, which is why when I got in, when I got into the world of AYA, I was very staunch on making sure that our boys and our girls had the option to do fertility treatment. You heard it from doctors and you've heard it from patients. It's important to consider your fertility options before treatment. You may be thinking, great, I'll just bring it up with my doctor during my next appointment. But it's not always so simple. Many doctors are unaware of the fertility options available or simply don't know where to refer patients. And the fact is, it's hard to find doctors with experience. The unfortunate reality is, many oncologists won't mention oncofertility to cancer patients before treatment. And if they do, the information they provide may not be the most accurate. The person you want to talk to is a reproductive specialist with oncofertility experience. Ask your oncologist for a referral before you undergo cancer treatment. If your doctor cannot refer you to one, ask to see a reproductive specialist in your area who works with young adults. During your first appointment, see if they're familiar with oncofertility and recognize its importance. If they do, that's a good sign. If there are no oncofertility preservation specialists in your area, consider meeting with one over telehealth. They may not be able to do a physical examination, but you'd be surprised how much doctors get done virtually. They can still review your chart, order tests and procedures, and make sure your cancer treatment plan aligns with your fertility goals. However, be aware that fertility preservation specialists must reside in your state to help you. Dr. Lakshmi Kondapali, a reproductive endocrinologist, further describes what a meeting with a fertility specialist should look like. One of the ways that I approach it is that I often ask if I can speak with the patient by him or herself. And so that we can have a private conversation and oftentimes patients, especially the young adolescents, have incredibly smart questions that they can ask. I do um, discuss with them any concerns that they have, not just about fertility, but also about safe sex practices, about contraception, about reproductive health. Patients will often feel comfortable speaking with me about those issues and the things that are on their mind privately where they may not feel as comfortable discussing that, them in front of their parents. At the end of that conversation, I always regroup back with the family and just summarize the points that we discussed in the consultation. However, patients do know that they have that private relationship with me as their provider. I really do try to provide them information but not overwhelm them and the most important thing that I try to convey is that they have options. They're in a situation where many of the things that they're facing are out of their control but this is a very specific decision that they can make um, and that they have a right to make and that's about their fertility. And that concludes our time together. Thank you for joining us. You can find a link to Grit Health's website in the description box below.
Next time, we move on to discussing the treatment phase. Tune into Treatment, the treatment process, for more information. Take a few pictures of the things that bring you joy. Maybe it's your dog, or your family, that tree in your backyard, or even a pair of old mismatched socks. Whatever it is, you can keep those little moments of happiness for when you need them the most. See you next time.